My name is Daniel Faircron, and my intention is to help you pass your life insurance module. And we're going to jump right into it, but I, re I would recommend as you study and go through the HLQP, there's lots of reading to do, there's lots of mock exams to do, and there's lots of videos to do, and you should bounce around a little bit. And one of the new things I've learned that I think works a lot for, for brand new people is that you should get the ethics professional practice one out of the way and then before jumping into life insurance go knock off accident and sickness and seg funds because a lot of the information we learn in health and investments can be used in a life insurance as well but uh, my name is daniel Faircron, and we're gonna we're gonna jump right in here But there's a disclaimer that the information I'm presenting here is just to help you pass your license. It's not interpreted as accounting, investment, legal, tax advice. It's not an offer to sell, solicit, buy any security, insurance, or any financial product. It's for educational purposes only. And I do not guarantee you pass because of this presentation. It does not replace any pre-licensing requirement in Manitoba. And it's just to supplement you in studying. And Let's get started. Let's jump right into this thing. What are we looking at? Well, the uh, getting licensed. Every day we're flooded with information. Many offer financial advice, but many, they're not licensed. And so some of the benefits are you're awarded um, by government agency. You know, it gives you authority to work in an occupation and it requires some criteria to be met. So it's a privilege to be licensed. Some professions are licensed and some professions are not licensed. I'm very glad this is a licensed profession. Now, we have a platform that allows you to do many different things before I get into exactly what, um, what you will be doing. But <clears throat> on, on what we'll be doing, we can do life insurance. We can do critical illness, which is if someone gets cancer, heart attack, stroke. Travel insurance, or if you're traveling abroad. Annuities is a form of investment to plan your retirement income. Health and dental. Final expenses is really for funeral plans. Maybe personal and commercial by referral only. Or home and auto by referral only. So we refer it. That's considered general insurance. So we won't be tested on any of that today. Do you need to be licensed to build a team? No, all business owners build a team. Whether you're building a team for yourself or for someone else. Uh, here in WFG, we believe that you should build a team for yourself and that you shouldn't do business alone and you shouldn't do life alone. And anyone who says maybe you should do life alone, maybe they're alone. You know, they want you to join them being alone. But I think you should be working with other people and you can share the opportunity and uh, you can get people involved and get them studying for their exam as well. You don't need a license to be able to build a team. But uh, let's go through some definitions. Let's jump in. Most learning is just language learning. And so one of the things that we find, it's actually very difficult to go through learning when we miss a word. So as you see a word that you don't understand or it's not redefined for you, then you want to pause. Use either the textbook, your, the, your trainer that, that's, that passed this stuff already, or Google it or DuckDuckGo it or search it to find the right answer. But in marketing, there's two different types of licenses. One is a resident license, which means you hold a residency or primary place of business in a specific province. For example, I am Manitoba resident and I'm licensed in Manitoba. A non-resident license is if you want to share about life insurance with someone that lives outside the province, you must retain an non-resident license you do not have to take the test again so if you get a license in manitoba or whatever province you're studying in then you can just pay the next province over to get the license so a non-resident license means you are already licensed as a resident in a specific province and you're seeking a license in another province so for example i'm licensed in manitoba a resident license but i'm a non-resident license in ontario So let's, uh, let's, let's review this where if you only have your accident and sickness license, let me change my view. 
You only have your accident and sickness and life license in British Columbia, which is where you have your primary residence. And you're at home, you're on a video call with a friend, John, who's at home in Edmonton, Alberta. Can you speak to John about any life insurance products? The correct answer here is no. That you can't speak to them about products. It's not a license to sell, it's a license to solicit. So you cannot solicit business if you're not licensed in that province. Now the first question we have here is you have your life in ANS in British Columbia, which is where you have your primary resident. Your friend John, who lives in Edmonton, is coming to Vancouver for a week. Are you eligible to speak and sell British Columbia products to John? Yes, it's in the province that you're making the transaction when it comes to life license. Are you eligible to speak and sell British Columbia life and accident and sickness to brought John? That will be a yes. Types of agents. When you are licensed, you're commonly called an agent or a producer. One is captive agent. So a captive agent is really a career agent working for one insurance company and sells only that company's products. Think if I work for Ford and I only sell Ford cars. A non-captive or independent agent work for themselves and they sell insurance products of multiple companies. Independent agents can represent many companies that appoint them. So for example, if I sell one insurance company, I don't work for that company. Or if I sell one investment company, I don't work for that company. I work for myself. For example, I also don't work for World Financial Group. I work for myself. I'm very happy to be on the World Financial Group platform, but I don't work for them. They are a platform that helps me with compliance, legal, payroll, product, uh, and a lot of other things on the administrative side. But non-captive means you have lots of options. Captive means you have usually much less options. Many times if you walk into RBC and you're sitting down with an RBC agent, it's likely the RBC agent might be captive because it's a bank. Now, they do have non-captive agents as well on the Dominion security side. But I like to fact I like the fact that I am non-captive. Fiduciary. Now this is a new term that it's a person of trust that you have a financial responsibility towards your client. And so the standard in, in the financial industry is that it's suitable that you want to prioritize the coverage that best fits the client and affordability that you want to find the policy that the client can fund long term that if they don't keep it it's probably not good for them and we always want to talk about doing it right doing it with pride where it should be able to be public here's what I did here's why I did it and we don't always have the right answer but if some things are public are you proud of what you did and do you feel like you did it right so let's look at general general insurance rules as we go through this what is insurance Insurance is basically just a transfer of risk. It's a transfer of risk from one party to another through a legal contract. And it provides a guarantee that, sorry, it's a transfer of risk from one party to another through a legal contract. It provides a guarantee of compensation for a specific event that might happen. What are the most common things you insure? Car insurance, health insurance, warranty, house, you know, different things you insure. And so we protect our responsibilities and our assets. And a lot of us have purchased insurance already. It's nothing new. The insurance is based on the sharing of risk among a large pool of people. The larger the number of people, the more predictable the losses are. So, for example, they can say one in X, I don't know the number of houses, burn down every year. So they look at house insurance and they price it accordingly. They say someone in the 40s is this likely to pass away, so they price it accordingly. And they're able to pool that risk in a way that I can't do it. If I pass away and my wife needs income for the rest of her life, I don't have that money saved at this point. So insurance companies get rated. And the insurer's financial strength can be evaluated by looking at the company's reserves and their liquidity. The, um, there's two types, 
there's two types of insurance companies. There's a mutual company, think Equitable Life, and they're owned by their policy holders. The a stock company, maybe like IA Clarington, is owned by its its uh, shareholders. When an insurance company pays a dividend, they pay it to the policy holder if you're a mutual company, or to a stockholder, to a stock company. The profits go to the policy holders, and a stock company go to the stockholders. It's also called a participating company or a non-participating company. So a stock company has a legal requirement to take care of the stockholder first, second policy holder. But a mutual company has a requirement to take care of the policy holder first, and second, there is no shareholder. So there is no second person on that side. But a mutual company operates on a different governing level than a stock company. Terms, an insurer. An insurer is a company who issues an insurance policy. And an insurance policy is a written contract set forth by the company. So a lot of times when I talk to clients, instead of saying, hey, do you have a, can I, can I review your insurance policy? I'd say, hey, can I review your contract? Because it sound, for me, it sounds less invasive, but I'm asking for the same thing. But uh, one insurance company can offer different types of policies depending on the suitability of the client. And uh, different insurance companies can offer the, the same types of policies as well. So it's very competitive out there on what's going on. And um, a lot of the language we learn is, is trying to figure out what, what is actually happening. And so a person, the, the definition of a person can be an individual, but the definition of a person can also be a corporation or an association or a trust or a partnership. And so when we look at what is, um, what, what is the definition of a person, it is many things. But when I look at the, for example, the owner of a policy, could be an individual, a corporation, association, a trust, or a partnership. Types of life insurance. So as we go in, there's going to be different language we're learning. Many times it's new, but one type of life insurance is term insurance. And the other type of life insurance is permanent insurance. Now, the difference is not one terminates at a certain time and the other one is permanent lasts forever. The difference is this. The main difference between term insurance has no cash value and permanent insurance has cash value. So one, you could sell back to the insurance company based on the cash value and the other term insurance, there's no cash value. That's the difference. And so you can build both of them to last till age 100. And you could build both of them that they plan on being canceled. Permanent has cash value, term no cash value. So when we look at these options, most term insurance companies are renewable and convertible. What this means is I can buy a term early in life, very inexpensive, and then later in life I can convert it or renew it. So converting a policy, you can convert it to permanent at a later time without asking medical questions. So I can buy term insurance early, and then if I got sick, I could convert it to something that is permanent. It is a, is a great option if someone plans on buying life insurance, plans on starting a family, and they don't have a lot of money. So just lock in your insurability with some term. Some companies are convertible. Most in the industry are, but not all. And most are renewable, but not all. Uh, a lot of the ones I've seen online are renewable one time. So the policy, if it's renewable, renewable means it'll automatically renew when the term expires. So you have a certain price and then it renews to a different price, usually 80, 85, 100 years old some, but the premiums usually jump up in, in, a, in a big way. And so it's usually going to be a surprise. So there's different types of term. So in here, the purple line is the death benefit and the green line is your premium. So decreasing term says your death benefit is gonna be decreasing 
but your premium is going to be level. And a lot of times we use this for mortgage insurance. Another type of term is level term. So if I buy a 20 year decreasing term or I buy a 20 year level term, the premium is level and the debt benefit is also level. Another one is called increasing term. So this is where the death benefit increases and the premium also increases. This is common, sometimes they do a five or 10% increasing death benefit rider where it continues to increase and keep up with inflation. And you can also, we don't sell it, but it, it's an example where you do life insurance with return of premium. So every time you pay a premium, the death benefit goes up a little bit, but there's decreasing term, level term, or increasing term. So level term is the simplest form of insurance. It's like renting an apartment. The insurance company pays a death benefit should anything happen within the length of the term. You can have the premium set in different ways. So annual renewable term means you pay the insurance premium annually and then the year later you're a little older they don't redo the medical but the premium goes up a little bit art and yrt are the same thing yearly renewable term or annual renewable term one of the benefits of art very inexpensive when you're young one of the downsides very expensive when you're old five-year level term is exactly what it sounds this is very common with mortgages. They lock in a five-year term because they got a five-year mortgage. Ten-year term on the personal side is the lowest, the smallest term we can sell other than ART, and the premium goes up every 10 years. Most common insurance out there is 20-year term. The reason it's the most common is because if someone has young children, they probably need insurance for 20 years. But most people are going to live longer than 20 years but it is the most common sold. So five, 10, 20, we can do 30 year term, 40 year term, term to 100, um, many different, we can do 14 year term, you know, you could pick your term essentially and find out, hey, what is, what is the risk? When we're selling term insurance, usually match the length of term to their need. So for example, if I have a five year old, maybe I buy 20 year term to protect my family until my son is 25. If I have, a uh, 15-year-old, maybe I could get away with a 10-year term. Or maybe there's 20 years left till I retire, so maybe I buy a 20-year term to protect my wife. And so we want to match the term to the length of the, the need. Advantage, it's typically low cost. So when you're taking your exam and they ask questions, and they say, this family has no money. This family is poor. What do you recommend? Many times if you see the low cost, it's a term insurance. And it's renewable, convertible option are a good benefit to it. Disadvantages is only insurable for a specific amount of time. If you miss a premium payment, the, the payment, sorry, the, the policy will lapse if a premium payment is missed. And then the, you feel like the premium is wasted if you don't die within the term. Human nature says, I want to get something back. Although it's very low cost, you're not putting anything extra in for the future. And if you become uninsurable, then you're forced to keep your policy and either renew at high rates or convert within that company. But uh, beyond a maximum age, if you hold it till a certain age, um, it might lapse the policy. For example, equitable lapses are on 85 years old, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But Empire, if you're able to hold out term until 100 years old, they'll actually pay out the death benefit. So different policies are, are different lengths, but every contract is different. So here's a question. Mr. X purchases a home with a 30-year mortgage. He's concerned if he dies prematurely, the mortgage will not be paid. Which policy best suits him? Well, we have annual renewable term where the premium starts low, but in 30 years it's a little higher. 30-year decreasing term because he's going to pay off the mortgage in 30 years. 30-year increasing term or 30-year level term. Where here this thing says 30-year decreasing term. That's what it's supposed to say. In practice, we might add on, hey, what the price is and, and changing things. But if, I, if the question when you're taking an exam says, 
He's concerned if he dies prematurely, the mortgage will not be paid. Which policy best suits him? 30-year decreasing term. I apologize. For and so some of the choices of permanent insurance are you have whole life and you have universal life. So we're going to go through some of these and, and help have a better understanding of both of these. Part of the premium purchase is insurance that can then be sold back to the insurance company, creating a cash value. They calculate a fixed premium, and that fixed premium is for your whole life. Instead of just paying the net cost of pure insurance, you pay a calculated fixed premium to make it level your whole life. The extra money you put in can be billed up as cash value. We're going to talk about that a little more in detail in a bit. But uh, there's a guaranteed interest rate on the policy that there's, can never have a loss, and there is a guaranteed expected rate as well. There's a pay schedule. Many of these are 10 pay, 20 pay is the most common. You can do a lot of pay till age 65, and it's designed prior to issue. It's a permanent policy desire, designed to be your entire life. And the non-forfeiture benefits there's some non-forfeiture benefits that are available, which means we're going to talk about that right away. There's a, con there's a guaranteed rate that could be conservative. So if someone said, if a client says, if you're reading a question that says, this client is very conservative, that means whole life might be the answer. And uh, premium is fixed. Now, of course, in reality, outside of the exam, if you overpay, you create some flexibility. But if you pay just the target, you got to continue to pay that target. The death benefit is fixed. It's considered fixed. It does increase over time. And accessing the cash value can eliminate some guarantees. Or so if you pull out too much cash, it might hurt the guarantee. So question, an accountant has an income potential for 20 years, but they're looking for a permanent insurance policy. What is the best policy that would suit them? A 20-year decreasing term, a 20-year inflation term, a 20-year increasing term, or a 20-year pay. So when it says 20 pay, that means 20-year premium, and then your policy lasts forever. That's a whole life. But when you have 20-year term, this guy's looking for permanent policy, so 20 pay policy is really the only one that fits the, uh, fits the deal here. There's four types of non-forfeiture options. Now, the word non-forfeiture means non-cancel. That's what it means. You're not going to forfeit your policy. So there's four non-forfeiture options. Option number one here is cash surrender value is number one. The other option is an automatic premium loan. An automatic premium loan is if you stop paying... That means your cash value will pay for you. There's reduced paid up insurance and there's extended term insurance. We're going to look at these, possibly look at a review with them. And then uh, we're going to get through uh, the details. So this means non forfeiture means I buy something. After 10 or 15 years, I don't want it anymore, but I don't want to cancel it. What are my options of keeping it and not paying for it? So let's look at some of these. One of them is cash surrender value, which means if I cancel it, I get some cash back. So here, cash surrender value, maybe it is uh, 11,000 or 29,000 in your 20. The policy has a cash value that I can sell back to the insurance company. Now, I just want to make it clear, in most cases, actually in almost all participating whole life cases, the cash value is not based on your overpayment. It's based on the present value of the future death benefit minus unpaid premium, which means it depends how far you are from your medical and how close you are to being elderly or, or passing away, that your cash value at age 100 for a participating policy must be the same as your death benefit. So that cash value is going to grow in the last third of the policy. Here question is, a client opens a permanent policy. After five years, he needs to surrender the policy. What is the client's surrender value after five years? Well, we look at the chart, five years, $4,588. That's what the client's going to get back. 
auto premium loan insurance. So you use the cash render value to pay the insurance premium. So this is if a client wants to miss a premium, they don't miss the premium, they just instead of paying it from their income, they pay it from their cash value. So the question is, the annual premium of $12,000, if at year 10, the client fails to make the premium, based on automatic premium loan, how long until the policy lapses? So I say, okay, $12,000, 98,000 is the premium, so we can probably make $12,000 into 98, about eight years. Non-forfeiture, reduce paid up. Someone says, this is a case where if someone's maybe terminally, or they don't want to pay anymore, but they want a permanent policy. So you get a reduced insurance. Instead of keeping 100,000 of coverage, you can keep a reduced amount. So if someone has a death benefit of 100,000, and they decide to do a paid up insurance that's reduced in year 20, the benefit would be in year 20, 63,100. And uh, it will last till 100 years old. It won't last till age 65. That means the uh, in 20 years, it'll be the, the, the policy. And so a lot of times people don't have reduced paid up policies. They have paid up policies at age 20. But that's how you calculate it. And then this is a situation where someone says, hey, I'm terminally ill and I don't want to pay my insurance anymore. So we can do extended term insurance. So you can convert a permanent policy back to term and depending on your cash value is how long the policy will last. So you can use existing cash value to purchase paid up term. So if I think I'm going to die in, here's an example, 50 years old, they stop paying at year 10. The policy, this policy defaults to extended level term insurance. So here in 10 years, you'll get 18 years left, 18 years and 72 days. So the policy will last till he's 68 years old and 72 days old. If he's terminally ill and he thinks he's going to live less than 20 years, maybe you just do extended level term insurance. And so the three main forfeiture options, if someone doesn't want to pay, they could cancel the policy and get the cash value out. They can take a paid up permanent policy but a reduced death benefit. Or they can take term insurance for a level for however long. And so the amount of risk the insurance company takes is very similar. It just depends what fits the client's options the best. So let's go to universal life. Now, by the way, the non-forfeiture options are going to be on the exam. And so I think you, if you're not clear on them, you should review them so you have an idea of what they are. Universal life, similar to whole life, and it's a permanent policy designed for your entire life, but it gives you a flexible premium and a flexible death benefit. So what this means is you pay your cost of insurance and the extra money goes direct to cash value. So the cash value is not based on the risk the insurance company takes, but the amount of money you have put into the policy. So there's two death benefit options in universal life. This stuff is going to be on the test. So it's, it's pretty basic. One is level death benefit and the other is increasing death benefit. What this means is, if your death benefit is the purple line, X, the more money you put into the policy, the less insurance you're purchasing. The other option is, if I purchase a $500,000 insurance policy, every dollar I put in increases my death benefit. So on a level death benefit, my cost of insurance per unit goes down as I get older the amount of insurance I buy goes down. Now, increasing death benefit, the amount of insurance I buy stays the same. And so it's almost like an inflation building policy. Now, there's two different types of costs. So there's two different types of death benefits, and there's two different types of costs. I can pay my cost a level cost, which is kind of like a whole life. They just tell you what the term to 100 would be. And the other option is I can look at the... YRT or yearly renewable term. If I do level, what happens is I have less cash value in the first and second third of the policy, but in the last third, my costs don't get out of control. With yearly renewable term or ART, early on in the first third, I build up cash value quite a bit, 
In the second third, I kind of break even, but in the last third, a lot of times my cash value will deteriorate to pay for YRT. So there's an investment risk. It says here, investment performance has more impact on YRT cost. And so if someone wants the investment side, the YRT will build up immediate cash value. Flexible premium. This works if the question says, Mr. Daniel is a real estate agent. Some years he makes a lot of money. Some years he makes little money and he wants a permanent policy. But he's afraid he'll miss a premium. Then check off universal life. Flexible death benefit. You can increase the death benefit by increasing what you put in. The permanent policy designed to last your entire life. And you can choose from many investment funds. The disadvantage is if I use a guaranteed rate in a universal life, it sometimes could be a, a conservative rate, and underfunded policies may require additional premium later in life. So let's look at the, the comparison of do we understand some of these things? One thing is to pass a test and understand. We want to be able to do both. So term insurance is considered temporary, whole life, and universal life are considered permanent. Permanent means they have cash value. Temporary means no cash value. But in reality, we can do permanent, we can do term insurance till age 100, and you just keep paying, or you can do whole life. Um, so, so the main difference is they have cash value. That's the, the main difference. The premium for term insurance is fixed. Whole life insurance is fixed. You can pay the target or you could overfund it. And universal life insurance is flexible. You have a, three types of premium. You have a minimum, a maximum, and a target. So minimum, target, overfunding. The death benefit on term insurance is typically fixed. Whole life insurance is flexible, but you got to pay it up addition where it can grow. In universal life, it's flexible because you can get an increasing death benefit. But you could also pull that back out. They grow tax-free. There's no tax as they grow. The whole life insurance is a fixed product, and universal life is considered a variable product or market-based. And there's access to cash value in whole life and universal life. So if the question asks, this guy wants cash value, well, then we got to go to either universal life or whole life. So let's ask some questions. Out of these types of insurance, which combines a savings component with a flexible premium option. Universal life. If it asks for flexibility, universal life. It says they're worried about the market and want guarantees, whole life. If the client's poor, on a tight budget, you know, lots of kids, you know, poor career, term life insurance. So let's move into policy designs. Life insurance can be designed based on who the owner is or who the insured and so we have what's called the juvenile life insurance policy where the owner is the parent and the insured is the child. We call that a juvenile life policy. We have what's called joint first to die. That pays out when the first person dies. So you have two people or more. When the first person dies by that halo, the second person gets a check. The beneficiary it might not be the life insurance. Sometimes there are many times they're used in business. And same thing with the other way. Now, first to die, depending on the age and, and stuff like that, has to typically be the same amount of death benefit. So if I am if I got $3 million life insurance, my wife has a million, it's hard to do joint first to die. But if we both have a million, many times in reality, we just check the prices. Joint last to die is where both husband and wife or the two joint owners have to pass away. And then the children get the check. I've seen one of these in my industry, and this is not part of the study, where husband and wife bought insurance on each other, and it was joint last to die, and they expected to take care of each other with the policy. So what happened was, we had to replace that with policies that would protect the married couple instead of protecting the children. So joint last to die pays at the second death. Usually it's for estate taxes because of spousal rollover provisions to save taxes. Now, there's business uses of life insurance. This is a chapter in a textbook. And so it's a little more detailed, but we don't want to make you business experts. We just want to help you pass the exam. 
One use is called a buy-sell agreement. Business partners can use life insurance. In case a partner passes away, the way it works is, let's say I'm in business with you, and I pass away. How is the business going to buy my wife's shares, which she inherited from me, from you? So the way it works is, the um, if I'm in business with you and you pass away, I don't want to be in business with your wife. If you're in business with me and I pass away, you don't want to be in business with my wife. So use a buy-sell agreement to be able to bail it out, where typically the accountant figures it out, the lawyer writes it out, but the life insurance bails it out. That's what we got to remember. Key employee. Hey, if you've got a business where one employee makes most of the revenue and brings most of the money in, maybe you want to put some insurance on him of how long would it take you to replace that guy? So key employee insurance. The business owner should be the owner of the policy and the payer, and the insurable interest is a f- financial loss between uh, the parties. So, so submitting an application. Let's jump right into it. There's different parties to a contract. Now, this is a confusing way we make the terms. The owner is the applicant, is the insured. The person who has control over the policy during an insured's lifetime. They have the power to access cash value, surrender things, um, make changes, changes in beneficiary. The life insured is the person whose life is being insured. The life insured forms a part of the contract. They got to sign. The beneficiary doesn't form a part of the contract. And so the life insured is the person whose life is being insured. They do not, the beneficiary does not form a part of the contract unless they're irrevocable. So a two-party contract is we have the owner, also known as the insured, and the life insured, and the insurer. A three-party contract is where the owner is not the life insured. So the insured could be the son, the life insured could be the mom, and the insurer could be the insurance company. So when you have a party to a contract, everybody needs insurable interest and the owner must possess an insurable interest on that person. It's typically based on a financial relationship that exists at the time of application. So a son can buy insurance on the mom. A business owner can buy insurance on a business partner. But a business and upline cannot buy insurance on a downline. So the question is, What's the main purpose of insurable interest? The main term is to protect and preserve a life insurance company against foul play. What if a company goes bankrupt? Well, in the rare case this occurs, Asuris Asuris was founded as a safety net, protecting policyholders if the company, the insurance company, issue a policy cannot keep its promise. They're a non-profit organization and under regulation that guarantees that a minimum of the 90% of the death benefit or 100% if it's less than a million if the insurance company fails. And so Assurus is the backing behind insurance companies failing. So if Paul purchases a universal life policy and a death benefit of 1225000 if the insurance company goes bankrupt, how much would Paul get back from Assurus. It would be 90% of the death benefit. So we just calculate what the death benefit looks like, 90%. So as a licensed agent, we aid in limiting exposure to money laundering, tax evasion, and other financial crimes. Early in my career, I thought I'll never be exposed to money laundering because it's not a big issue. But I found that it's actually very common, and I've, I've seen it a multiple of times. So, rapid movement of funds where people are moving money. Um, Lack of clarity regarding the customer's identity. I've had clients say, I want to buy insurance. I say, can I see ID? They say, no. They've actually changed their mind. They don't want to buy insurance. Or a lack of clarity with regarding the source of funds where they don't want to tell you where they got the money. Um, Inflated financials without lying about their money. Unrelated third parties. Or a cash-intense business. If you own a hot dog stand and it's all cash, 
and you put it into a policy, when you die, it becomes legitimate money if, uh, if you pass away or even pull it out of the policy. So red flags, you want to look at some of these things and make sure as a, you, you talk to the, your trainer or talk to head office if you see this kind of stuff. Um, fraud represents intentional deception. Now you got to remember, if you don't disclose the identity of the source of funds, um, it's one of the biggest red flags of financial crime. An example, you write a write business where you have no intention or in order to receive commission, advances, or promotion, that's considered a fraud. Where if you write a half a piece of business and they just don't let them do their medical, so you got to be careful. Uh, fraud is, is a criminal, and then the police will get involved. But uh, when you look at replacing a policy, your client might have an existing policy. It's your job to educate the client on what they have. And if replacing a policy has to be in the best interest of the client, and the client has to go through what's called a life insurance replacement declaration, which explains, hey, here's the here's the things you should know about it. And the client should have some, not just have clarity, but have some written clarity about it. We're going to look at the different types of policies so the client knows what they're buying. How much coverage it is, where if you go from term to permanent, a lot of times you have a lot less coverage. If you go from permanent to term, many times you have a lot more coverage, but it doesn't last as long. How much premium they're going to pay, differences in cash value, differences in guarantees or extra riders, maybe some of the surrender charges they have, or about the two-year contestability, where if they have a three-year-old policy and they get a new one, what does that look like for them? So we got to fill this stuff out and make sure the client has as little potential to be confused as possible. Documents required when you submit business. You want to do a personal financial strategy. You got to know who the client is. You have to do a disclosure saying what we can sell. Has to be a reason why letter explaining the reason why you recommended. You need to have some illustrations in your file. A life insurance replacement declaration, we call them an LIRD. And then application to sustain your file too. So there's some documents you got to have in a file, including meeting notes. Now let's look at underwriting. Let's keep this going, moving quickly. When you submit an application, that's just the first step. You want to apply for insurance. Then there's an underwriting step. And then there's a decision and a delivery step. Getting approved for life insurance is a privilege. It's not a right. Not everybody gets approved. So when we're applying, a lot of times instead of saying, would you like to apply for insurance? I say, would you like to submit a request for coverage? Because I think it sounds a little nicer. There are sources of information. We, as the insurance industry, are allowed to discriminate for insurance purposes only. So the sources is a PAPITA. There's a PAPITA form. And then underwriters have access to your, your agent report and your personal interview on the application. An APS is a doctor's report or an attending physician statement. Maybe a paramedical if it's been completed. MIB or Medical Insurance Bureau is like a credit score, but it's actually any past declines or applications for insurance get recorded. And then a potential driving record. In Manitoba, we call that the MVR or Motor Vehicle Report. You could be approved for life insurance, but you could be declined for certain riders. The reason is because underwriters look at two different statistics. One is the word mortality. Mortality is the likeliness of dying. Morbidity is the likeliness of getting injured. So something that's morbid is getting injured. Something is mortal. Mortality is uh, getting dying. So you got to remember those two words, mortality, what that means, and morbidity, what that means. So when you look at different risks, one person could, six people could have the same age, same policy, but different ratings. So some examples is if you're preferred, standard, preferred is just a better rating, or table rated means they're going to add extra premium, maybe someone's overweight, maybe someone has a dangerous sport, different reasons. So the rating or the rate class is uh, depending on what they pay. Question, who are the potential parties that must sign an application before underwriting can begin? The applicant, 
the insured, and the agent. Now we know it's a two-party contract with the applicant and the life insured of the same person. If the life insured is a different person, then it is a three-party contract. So when you're buying a policy, there can be riders on the policy. What a rider is, it's an optional feature that you can add to the policy. Just like if you buy a car, you can add things to the car, add a stereo, add rims, add paint. The policy, you can do that too. So we can add riders. One is an additional insured rider. We do this lots for children where you get additional coverage. Sorry, we do it for children and spouses. You can add my spouse to the same policy, only the one policy fee. We do a guaranteed insurability rider. We do this lots for children. It allows the insured to purchase additional amounts of life insurance at a, at a future date without needing a physical exam. So my son buys a policy. We do an insurability rider so he doesn't have to do a medical when he's in his 20s. And then when he buys more coverage, regardless of his health, he can still get it. Term insurance rider. A lot of permanent policies are a permanent base with a big term insurance rider on top. It allows the insurance to add extra pieces. And then critical illness rider. You have a life insurance policy with a critical illness rider on top. Most policies in our industry are actually combination policies or we call a layered solution or layered policy. A return of premium rider. This means at a certain date based on the contract or a certain age, you can get all your premium back or a portion of it. Payer waiver of premium means the person who, if the payer gets disabled, they don't have to pay premium anymore. So waiver of premium. This will be in the exam. I always see questions about this. The premium is waived if the owner becomes disabled for a waiting period specified in the contract. The cash value can still grow and dividends are still paid. So for example, you still pay the premium if it's three months. You pay one, two, three. Then what happens on month four, if, the, if you're still disabled, they refund premiums one to three. And the premiums are waived going forward. So if it's a 90 day waiting period, this is how it works. Your uh, premium is refunded to you after 90 days. A waiver of premium with disability income is the same as waiver of premium, except they pay you monthly income. We do a lot of this with a waiver of premium with a mortgage attached to a mortgage. So question. Bill has a waiver of premium with his universal life. He suffered a disability due to illness for 18 months. How many months will his premium be waived? So it says 12 months because of the waiting period. Nothing because disability for accidents is not an illness. 18 months or 12 months because that's a maximum months. So what would happen is for the first three months he would pay, then in month four, his month to three would get refunded back to him. So in total, he would have uh, 18 months of no premium. That's what it would look like. So other riders here, we look at uh, accidental death and dismemberment. If someone dies by accident, and that's uh, the death must occur with 90 days as a result of the accident. Or terminal illness, where it's an accelerated death benefit. Many times this is not a rider, but it's a non-contractual piece of the policy that you can access some of your death benefit in the form of a terminal illness. Question, John has type 2 diabetes. He had his right leg amputated and then seven months later died from the same illness. He had 100,000 life insurance plus an accidental death and dismemberment rider with double indemnity, which means it pays out double. That's what double indemnity means. How much will his beneficiary receive? So, accidental death and dismemberment. This is how a lot of the questions are going to be. Accidental death and dismemberment. Um, if you get your leg amputated for a disease, it's not accidental dismemberment or accidental death. So, it doesn't have a double payment. So, it's not 210000 or 200000 Now, he had type 2 diabetes, but if it's a life insurance policy, the diabetes doesn't matter. What happens is, when he dies, the beneficiary would get $100,000, the death benefit. 
So many questions you're going to get have extra information. Not, not enough information. They have too much information. Long-term care is a rider that would, a lot of times sits on top of a disability policy. Or um, we're going to learn about it as a life insurance. But what you want to know is if you can't perform two out of the six daily activities, if you can't remember these six, you're going to have to look them up when you take your test. They're washing, toileting, dressing, feeding, incontinence, which means you cannot contain your pee or poo. This is a diaper problem. And transferring in and out of bed. Um, it's determined if a person suffers from a cognitive impairment. It also triggers long-term care. So two out of six or cognitive impairment. Now, when you pass away, while your application is in underwriting, I sit down with someone, I do a request for coverage, they pay a premium. What happens is if I have an application and the first premium, then if someone dies while in underwriting, if the conditionally was covered, the insurance company would continually underwrite the application. If they would have approved your application, then they pay the claim. So we want to check with every company for their individual rules on how that works. But there's a temporary insurance in place. Many people have a limit of $1 million on their temporary insurance agreement. But we're almost done here. Delivering a policy. Approval is based on the health and financial situation at the time of application. It is important to confirm there's any changes. So when we deliver a financial policy, I had a situation where the client broke her leg. Then I got to inform the insurance company, this client has a broken leg. Since I last applied, she slipped and broke it. And then they say, well, let's wait till it's healed. And when the doctor says, clean bill of health, then I could go deliver the policy. If there's any changes, we have to notify the insurance company and say, please, you know, they'll reissue to us. We want to declare any change to insurance company and then wait for a new approval. And they say, hey, yeah, you can issue or we must put, we must delay the issuing. So things to review when delivering a policy. We maybe want to review the illustration, the delivery receipt with the medical questions. And sometimes they come with an amendment where they say we're going to have an exclusion or a change in what they're going to cover. And then any additional delivery requirements that there is. Uh, by the way, some of those amendments, if we uh, if we apply and we say, oh, we forgot to tell you that uh, the client had a kidney stone four years ago, then it'll say an amendment as a part of the contract, client had a kidney stone four years ago. So they'll initial, just the ex if we email them, they add that in the form of an amendment. A free look period. There's a, there will be a test on this. This will be a question. Once the free, once the policy is delivered, delivered, the free look period begins. The free look is a specific window that the client can change their mind for any reason without a penalty and they get a refund of the initial premium. The free look is usually between 10 and 30 days. Most of the carriers we use is a 10 day free look period and a 30 day is could be for seniors age 65 and plus. But it's typically on that if you take a test, it's gonna be a 10 day look, free look period. So the insurance company receives an application and the initial premium. On January 16th, the insurance company receives a medical exam five days later. A month and a bit later, the insurance company approves the application, issues the policy, and the agent delivers it on February 26th. So application date is January 11. Medical information is January 16. February 22 is the issue date delivery date is February 26th. On what day does the client qualify for conditional coverage? The application and premium goes in, January 11, they are covered. On what day does the free look begin? The free look begins when they get the contract to start free looking it. And the final question here, if the client accidentally dies on February 1st, would the insurance company pay the claim? Yes, they would pay the claim. So an insurance company receives the application on January 11. On January 16, the client passes away from a car accident. The insurance company declines the application due to the client's medical exam results and returns the initial premium. 
On what day does the client qualify for conditional coverage? So it would have been here January 11. On what the client accidentally dies on January 16th, does the insurance company continue to do underwriting? They do it as if they don't, they underwrite it as if they don't have a, they don't know the client died. When the client actually died, the insurance company pays the claim because they would have declined. So the insurance company, so you can't just find that unhealthy guy, apply, and then he's got 90 days of free coverage. He would have to actually get approved. So the insurance company receives here on January 11. The insurance company approves the policy and issues it. Gets delivered on February 22nd. On February 26th, the client passes away. Does the client qualify for conditional coverage? Yes, because he paid an application and premium. If the client accidentally passes away on January 13th, would the client have paid the claim? Yes, they would have. This is incorrect and part of our exam. My apologies. Let me get this uh, clean. I believe they would have, but you have to default to what the textbook says and study. But we want to make sure we have uh, accurate information here for you. So if the client accidentally passes away on January 13th after the client insurance company gets the policy, they would pay the claim. And February, when the client dies on February 26th, will the insurance company pay the claim? Yes. So there's a trial application. Clients can submit an application without paying initial premium and still go through underwriting. We call it a lot of times COD. Since no initial premium is submitted, that client does not get conditional coverage. So insurance company receives an application without a premium. The application, the applicant completes a medical exam and the insurance company approves the policy on February 22nd. On February 26th, the client submits the initial premium and the agent delivers the policy. What is the day the policy is effective? February 26th, premium is paid and the contract is delivered. If that client accidentally passed away on February 23rd and they never paid a premium, then there's no contract. A contract requires premium to be paid. Now there's something called an incontestability clause. Incontestability means usually it's two years to detect fraud, errors, or misstatements at the time of application. The incontestability is to protect insurers. If a client passes away within the first two years of the issue date, the insurance company has the right to review and investigate whether the client gave incomplete information. If the insurance company can prove incomplete information was misrepresented on the application, they do not have to pay the claim. So this protects them from fraud. I've had a few pay payouts where this was the case, and one of them, the, the client, uh, passed away in a car accident, and then what happened is the when we did the application, they, the client actually had a motor vehicle report sent in. So they had the medical record of even the driving record. So every infraction was already stated, so there was no misrepresentation. So sometimes the more medical information the, client, the, the insurance company gets, the less likely you have headaches when it comes to claim. And the incontestability clause can protect the consumer because if a client's health changes and they pass away in the third year, the insurance company must pay the claim. Now, the insurance company can always investigate fraud, but when it's misrepresentation, but if it's fraud, it voids the contract. But if it's uh, some incomplete information, they are allowed to go back even before a claim. So incontestability means the client could get new information six months from now, and they can go back and, and request more information even before a claim is made. But if you don't commit fraud and you disclose everything, you should be okay. So suicide, in the first two years, 
the insurer will refund the premium to the beneficiary. It is covered after two years. That will be on the exam. First two years, if you commit suicide, it does not pay. After two years, it does pay. So if you miss a, if you miss a premium, there's a grace period for 31 days after the premium due date before the policy lapses. If a cash value policy lapses, you can reinstate it within three to five years, providing proof of insurability and by back paying all the required premiums plus some interest. The requirements do vary from insurer to insurer and province to province. So beneficiaries, this is new language for a lot of people. We have the insured, that's called grandma and grandpa. Then you have the primary beneficiaries, which is son and daughter. Then you have contingent beneficiaries, which is contingent on the primary beneficiaries not being alive, which is grandson and granddaughter. And then the tertiary is third in line. And a beneficiary can be an individual, a trust, a business, or a charity. So many times on the policy we do a primary beneficiary and a contingent beneficiary. And a tertiary can many times be stated in the will. So when we look at beneficiaries, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back here. If the insured and primary beneficiary die at the same time, the insurer uses what's called a common disaster clause, which means they assume the primary beneficiary died first so that the death benefit can be paid to the contingent beneficiaries. So it doesn't, it doesn't get paid to the primary beneficiary and then it goes by their will. It actually skips them if they die at the same time. So, two styles of beneficiaries. Revocable, which means the client can revoke the beneficiary. And they can control the policy. Irrevocable means the client must consent from the beneficiary before making changes. And this looks like many times in a marriage breakdown or in a business deal. Or if it's business insurance, they can make an irrevocable beneficiary, which then makes that beneficiary what's called preferred. We're going to jump into that shortly. So... B, would like to change a revocable beneficiary, which is true. B needs to notify the beneficiary of the change. Or B needs to call his agent and trust he'll take care of it. B needs to get signatures from the new beneficiary. Or B needs to fill out a change of beneficiary form and submit it to the insurance company. D, the form must be submitted to the insurance company. It can't just be sitting on my desk. So it's got to be sitting on, it's got to be submitted. Let me just plug in one of my devices here. So it doesn't die. Now, death benefit options. Most consumers choose lump sum. That's the, that's the truth. But they can also choose um, a fixed period, a fixed amount, interest only, um, they could do a single premium annuity, so there are other options. I recommend when there's questions about this, we quickly look that up in the textbook so you know what the options are. After sales service, we're just coming on the final stretch here. As the agent, it is good to provide the following service after the policy has been in force. So we want to help a regular review. Many times this is either annual review or it's a review when the client makes changes. So I just had a situation where I've been five years without a review with a client, and I contact them and I say, has anything in your life changed? And they say, nothing has changed, zero. So I say, so you haven't moved, no kids, no, they say, nothing has changed. So I say, is there any need to review? And they say, no, okay. If there's lots of changes, lots of reviews. So sometimes you want to review when there's a change or every year. Maybe there's a beneficiary change request. I bump into a lot of policies where the beneficiary should have changed, but it didn't. I got a handful that are, I got one where the mom is the beneficiary because they bought it before they got married. And then they got married, but didn't change it to the spouse. Or they want to go from non-smoker, smoker to non-smoker. Or they want to renew the policy at a different premium. Or they want to help a family to do a death claim. Or help a family apply for different additional coverage. A lot of these are not paid up front, or they're not paid to review, we're not paid to change their address, we're not paid to change the beneficiary, but we get paid up front for the policy with a commitment that we're going to help them with the other details. 
So this went through a little bit of the language of license prep. So you want to review, when you go to Oliver's, you want to look at maybe the Math Hub and the flashcards, but I would recommend do the chapter quizzes and go through them with the textbook so you learn how to look things up quickly. And then there's need to know videos, which are other video methods, and then reading the textbook. So I think the three main studies are videos, reading, and possibly chapter quizzes, which is different than reading the textbook. And then do the mock exam, get a good mark, and take your exam. And we're okay, you get a couple tries on the exam, but you should have a goal to book that exam. Just like in school, they say, I got an exam on Friday, so I got to cram the night before. But if you don't have a goal of writing the exam, you won't cram the night before. And I think also the life insurance exam, if you're looking to get into it, I think you should do the life insurance exam third place. I think when you look at the, the order of doing, you have four options. So you can do accident and sickness, segregated or investments, you can do life insurance or you can do ethics. You can do them any order you want. Life insurance is the longest and a lot of the stuff covered in the other modules is also covered in life insurance. And so life insurance has 12 chapters. Investments and health insurance have eight chapters and ethics and professional practice. There's only four, practice, four, four chapters. I recommend get ethics out of the way, then either do uh, health insurance or seg fund investments once those are knocked out of the way, come and finish off the life insurance and and you know get the, get the exam. The average person studies in our system here between 20 and 30 hours of study material to, to get their license. So it a, it's a, should be very quick, should be able to be done within 30 days. It should be able to be done within 30 days. That's how it's been designed. So I want to thank you for your time coming out. And as you go through this over and over, if you're listening to it over and over, um, reach out and, and get any questions or if we can make any adjustments and improve this, let us know. Thank you.